I'm very, very excited to be here. I am Chris Rakedahl. Uh, you're recently elected superintendent of public construction, and I met so many of you around the state over the last year. The honor of working in a system that is absolutely focused, as you heard from our introductory remarks, on 1.1 million students, but more than that, on communities from border to border, and on our business community who's trying to seek a workforce that will make them more dynamic and make Washington State a better place. There's no such thing as the education sector. It is the thing that drives everything about our future in the state of Washington. So I had a little bit of work to do when I got there. And I want to say briefly on a couple of points that are uh, maybe a little political, and then, and then get into some remarks that I hope will lead to some good questions because there is some time afterwards. The first thing we had to do is align with you and make sure that our public understood that we are not a system in conflict, we are a system working together. So the very first thing I did, as you saw, was get rid of a lawsuit from our office that was putting pressure on some of our districts. <laughs> the message is that we're all trying to support students and we have to line that up. We also had to build a pretty remarkable team in a very short amount of time in our organization. And I'm remarkably proud that we have Michaela Miller here, our Deputy Superintendent, and Dave Masson, our Head of Government Relations. They are here uh, with us today, and you'll get to meet them more and more over time. And Jamila Thomas, who some of you know as our Chief of Staff. Our goal is very simple, to put our organization in a position for you to say, that's a champion for us. Yes, they have a constitutional role to supervise the system, but I know they are working hard for our school districts, for our kids, for our educators, for our board members for our superintendents, and yes, you sexy business officers. We are here for you. <laughs> I did this for you. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. I did that work for 14 years in the college system, including have a, having a small piece of this Minard Center here. Uh, hell hath no fury like two college presidents fighting over the last capital dollar for a theater, by the way. Uh, yeah. I know that doesn't happen in K-12, ever, ever. So a couple things. This is an amazing moment in our history. If we are actually singularly focused on the success of kids as our mutual interest, then there really is no competing goals except the one goal that I am trying to impart everywhere I go. 100% graduation for every student in the state of Washington and a pathway that they are passionate about that leads to something beyond high school. That's it. That's it. We're not actually here to fund court cases, but it's important we do. We're not actually here to have governance conversations, but we need to. We're not actually here to debate prototypical school formulas versus student-weighted formulas, but it's important that we do. But those things become the object of political conflict and not the substance of results, the way that our focus on 100% graduation can be. So my first message to you as you get up on that hill tomorrow and the days after as you work with your members is never let them make this about the political object of this throwing back and forth. It's our job as advocates to make this about the purpose of public education, where more than 90% of our students are showing up every day passionate and caring, where amazing educators are greeting them every day, where a school bus driver gives them the first smile, where a volunteer in the community packs a, puts together a backpack on Friday to make sure they're fed over. Our policymakers have to come to one conclusion this year after all the difficulty. It is about on time graduation with calculus that matter for every single student. And you deliver that. So don't be shy about that message. I beg you. The second moment in our history here is that the feds are giving us some control back. We think. <laughs> <laughs> they were and they weren't, now they are maybe. And if we can find all the websites and where they went, we will absolutely figure out where they went. <laughs> So this moment is big, though, because, again, there are folks who want to use the conflict of Fed versus state relationships to be a reason not to move forward for our children. We can't let that happen. We are going to get that flexibility. And I'm really, really pleased that we have a, a state that's poised to capture that. But it is about empowering districts. It's not just this artificial conflict between Fed and state. It is about empowering districts. And as you know, we moved our submission date to September. And oh, thank God we did that. I the states who thought they were going to leap out there in April or May are wondering where all the rules went. 
and are certainly um, going to be uh, market movers on this conversation, and we will learn from them. But it's a big moment for us, and we shouldn't lose that moment. Secondly, we have this moment where the legislature is poised to put more resources in our system. And it is a court case that compels some of them that I beg of you when you go to the Hill, do not leave the cap. Increasingly, they are not moved by the litigation, though it is critical, and some of you have fought so hard for this, and we have a panel up here of folks who are gonna talk about that. <coughs> But there are an increasing number of them who say, I'm not doing this for a court. I want to do this for my community. So your job is to translate this legal obligation to the results in the community. When we invest, these are the outcomes we get. When we invest, these are the students who make progress. When we invest, this is the equity that we get to touch. Make it about them, because no legislator in this place or in this country will ever vote for something because another branch of government told them to. It will only and always be because they see themselves that's a big, big moment for us. It's a very different tone than you've seen from the fire superintendent. It was important that we drew attention to this. It was important that there was aggression for a while, but now it is solution time and focus on solution. The third big moment in our history is that we've never been more data focused on what it means to have 100% graduation. It's not enough that we're going to move the needle a half a percent or 1% on graduation. If you uncover the details, and find out that populations who have historically not been given equal opportunity and equal access to the system aren't making the same progress. We have an unbelievable ability now to go beyond this idea of just put money in the system and we'll all do better. We have to prove to policymakers and our communities and our students we're going to do better with Latino students and Latina students. We're going to do better with African American students. We're going to do better with students in poverty, foster youth, our LGBTQ youth our native students, our recent immigrants. We're going to be better with every child in this state if we get the resources we need, the policy we need, and the flexibility to be local communities serving our communities. That's a powerful notion in this state. The 21% of students who are not graduating on time look radically different than the 79% who are. And we got to get to that point. We've got to have the honesty with ourselves to say we better do practices differently. So the other thing I want to encourage you to do when you're on the Hill is absolutely demand the resources. You can cite the court case if you want to. But make the commitment that should we get three and a half billion or four billion or five billion dollars over the next couple of years, your practices will be fundamentally different because you will be resourced to do the things that you know are in your mission. This is not an isolated conversation about just getting more money. It's getting money so that we can change the dynamic for students. Flexibility from the feds, resources from the state, an understanding of our demographics like never before. And here's the fourth opportunity. We're going to hold ourselves personally accountable. It's a hard thing to say that for hundred years in the state when a student didn't graduate and we looked around to see who's responsible for that, it was all of us and none of us at the same time. So I think you should be honest about it. I want to be honest about it. At OSPI, we are giving up control of some things in early learning to clarify the lines. We're giving away a few things to another agency to clarify the lines. But we're challenging the system to say, where does it make sense to create this alignment? We can't talk about a better, more efficient, more effective system that many policymakers need to hear unless they also know we are in the game for more streamlining, more efficiency, more effectiveness. That's not code for we're going to cut budgets. It's legitimate alignment. And you've been doing a very good job in your community partnering with community-based organizations. You've been doing it with the business community. There's been more work in this state aligning our content and our standards horizontally across schools and vertically through the grades, but very few policymakers know the amazing work that's happening in schools. And I want you to tell that story because they don't understand how good we already are. And I'm, my commitment to you is that OSPI will be better at this. We will support you in ways we have not before. We will align with our partners in education. We will offend them at times to say it's not working right. It's our job to create discomfort any of you have read Florida's work on creative destruction, a phrase that I both cringe about and love at the same time. 
We will be created. We'll do things differently. But you've got to be honest that some things are going to break along the way when we take risks. And I think policymakers need to hear that. Because you've got half that chamber who says not another dime without radical change. And you've got another half of that chamber who says not an ounce more of change. We've done enough reforms until we get lots more money. And the only people with the sophistication to bring those folks together are you. Because you live it every single day and you know the practices that will change the game. So those are our moments. Flexibility from the feds, resources from the state, a deep, deep understanding of the lack of equity in our system, and a willingness to take risk in governance, both locally and at the state level. But we have to talk about the sacred cows along the way as well. When I meet with Republican legislators, I say to them, I want you to be a little uncomfortable that your state spends 2.9% of GDP on public education. Because the national average is a half a percent higher. And the almighty Massachusetts that you want us to look like, they're five tenths of 1% higher. What does that mean? A billion and a half dollars a year. Three billion dollars a biennium. Sound like a roughly familiar number legally? This isn't just some made up math. We underinvest in our public education system in the state, and we're one of the most powerful economic states in the union right now. But we don't do the return on investment. We don't do the R&D that any private sector company would do. They would figure out a portion of that resource to give back to shareholders, and then they would figure out that key resource to put back in the company, back in the business, back in the school, to make it even better. So I make my Republican friends uncomfortable by saying, you're underinvesting, period. I'm not going to be shy about that. That's not an offensive term. You just are. And oh, by the way, your educators, 49th out of 51 in the United States of America can include the District of Columbia in terms of their pay relative to the competition in their state. Why? Because if you graduate Washington State with a baccalaureate degree in just about anything, you've got an economy in some counties that is booming in ways you can't imagine. So teach for $36,000 or go work HR at Amazon for $55,000 with your BA. <coughs> Our kids are voting with their feet. And that's not the case across the state, of course, but it's real. So I want to make Republican members uncomfortable with truth. And I want you to make Democratic members uncomfortable with some truth, too. 295 school districts. 80 plus percent of students served in 59 districts. So about 20% of our students in the other 235 districts, 236 districts. They may be small, they may be rural, you may not be able to say their name. You may need a boat to get to them, or an airplane. But for God's sakes, every student in the state of Washington is entitled to an ample and complete and total amazing public education no matter where they live. Everywhere. And there's no question that if you live in rural Washington without the tax base, you don't have the same equal opportunity for your students as they do in urban Washington. And I tell my Democratic friends, it's not okay. Yes, you're the economic engine, but why? Because the Growth Management Act has driven so much economic development in three counties, and it's a good thing. But be honest with yourself. Can you have all that economic activity in a state constitutional framework that says equal opportunity for all kids and not admit that you're going to have to pay a little bit more so that rural Washington gets equal opportunity? That's an uncomfortable statement, but Democrats need to hear that. So both sides have sacred cows, and they've got to let them go. And that's what we're trying to do at OCI. Offend everyone at the same time. <laughs> but in ways that are pretty honest and data-driven and student and district focus. There are a few other sacred cows. Our organization has to be less bureaucratic. It has to line up better with other agencies. We have to have honest conversations that there are six organizations in Olympia who all have a different set of goals for the outcome in K-12, six. Probably five too many, but maybe we could tolerate three, but not six. So we have to have more honest conversations about how we're tripping over each other. And you have to be honest. You've got a sacred cow in your district. Are you working hard enough to recruit the diverse workforce and engage the parents 
in ways that make meaningful change for students in your community. It is fundamentally the difference in our outcome going forward. Our boards do not look like our students. Our superintendents do not look like our students. Our sexy business officers do not look like our students. In our organization, I came in with five females on our cabinet and 11 males. In an organization that's 72% female, in an, in an education sector that's more than 70% female. Now, it took me a month, so I'm sorry for the slow pace of this. But we now have nine females on our cabinet and seven males. It took us three and a half weeks. And we're going to get further. When I came in, there were two people of color on that 16 member cabinet. There are now four and almost five after the next hiring process. We now mirror the workforce in education, but we don't yet mirror our students. And we're going to keep running through walls and tearing down sacred cows and having hard conversations until our education system reflects the students that we serve. And when that happens, magic. Flexibility from the feds, additional resources, honest conversations with our policymakers, a focus on equity, and a governing structure that's more effective, and local districts who deliver services with adults in the system that look like their students. 49 other states will come to Washington in the next five years and say, how the hell did you do it? And we'll say, because we asked really hard questions and we offended each other along the way. But what choice do we have? We're competing in a global marketplace and our 1.1 million students are the greatest investment we will ever have. From the human passion standpoint, right down to that worker. I'll tell you how else we did it. Now I'm looking back. We delink the standardized test as one of only four states poised to do it because the test is not defined who our students are. That's it. <laughs> it certainly matters. And we will measure and we will measure and we will measure and we will be accountable as a system, as a state system, as local districts, right down the individual. But 46 other states have figured out how to create additional student achievement without denying diplomas to students despite taking more math and more science and more ELA and more subject content. So we'll be accountable and we'll have assessments, but we will not be one of those states that says to students, thank you for your 12 years of commitment and the $120,000 in taxpayer money we put into you. Now you didn't get over this test, so no diploma for you. It's ridiculous. We will also be a state in five years who looks back and says, Wow, that state made more progress, not just delinking tests, but creating a 24 credit diploma that is still full of unbelievable rigor, but meaningful pathways for students to post-secondary opportunities. The university for all mentality, it's gotta go. It's gotta go. And it's not because we don't want every student to have a shot. 40 years ago, the adults in the system, we were making poor choices. We were putting kids in tracks. We were making decisions for them based on horrific approaches to equity. I'm talking about a highly accountable system of meaningful assessments that allow students to understand their strengths and weaknesses, to develop high school and beyond plans, to work with counselors and parent engagement coordinators that wrap around kids and say, what are you passionate about? Now, how do we give you the rigorous coursework to get there? I will not be happy in the state of Washington until the people who drive through Seattle see the gorgeous lights of Queen Anne Hill and the beacon that is the high towers with all the finance leaders until people say that part of the city is almost as cool as that industrial part of the South End that makes it all possible to have the North End. That's when I know we've arrived. When we honor the manufacturer as much as the IT specialist. When we honor the brick mason as much as we do the account. This is our moment, folks. This is the Washington State moment where we rise above all the other states, but it's going to take really hard conversations. So have them tomorrow when you meet with policymakers. Be honest about your needs, but focus on how they see themselves and the results and what's going to make their community strong. It is about outcomes, it is about kids, it is about our future. It's not just about our kids. This is our moment. This our Washington State moment. Take advantage of it. Thank you very much.